So just to remind you about a few things from last Wednesday. Uh, so remember last week we were talking about integer programs, totally unimodular uni uni matrices and things like that. Um, so one thing we proved on Wednesday is that if you have a totally unimodular matrix and you have a, an integer vector b, then and you look at this polytope, so yeah, so if you have a totally unimodular matrix, you have an integer vector, you have these constraints, you know, given the, the usual sorts of linear constraints we look at, and the constraint that x is at least, well, x is non-negative, um, then every corner, so this gives you a polytope, and every corner of that polytope is actually an integer vector, right? This is one thing we proved last time. <coughs> so this is going to come up again in this lecture. Um, and <coughs> Another thing, so we define this, this thing called an incidence matrix where you just have a, a row for every um, vertex and you have, an, you have a column for every edge and the entry course in, in the kind of row corresponding to, to the vertex V, the column corresponding to the edge E, so that entry is zero if uh, V is not in, in that edge and it's one otherwise. Right, so every column has exactly two ones. <coughs> Um, and then we proved last time that the in incidence matrix of a graph is totally unimodular if and only if that graph is bipartite. And that turns out to be you know, quite um, useful for, for kind of understanding, getting a better understanding of these kind of matching theorems and matching algorithms for bipartite graphs. All right, so this is all review from Wednesday. To study something called the matching polytope, of a graph, and <clears throat> yes, yeah, so this will be our last lecture on this polytope stuff, and then next, uh, next time we'll, we'll move on to another topic, um, which will be the last kind of big topic of the module. Okay, so, so before I can define the matching polytope, I'm gonna need a couple of um, basic definitions. One of these definitions, so the first one actually was given earlier in the module, but just to, to remind you, so a set, X in Rn, and probably you've seen this also in other modules you've taken, but so a set is convex if whenever you take two elements, X, Y in X, and you take lambda between 0 and 1, you get that the convex combination so lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y is in x. All right, so basically this is saying if you take two points in x and you look at the line segment which joins them, then all of those points on that line segment are also inside of x. Right, so this is a, yeah, you may have seen this in analysis or, I don't know, calculus or, or something like that. And, um, okay, so another definition is the convex hull of a set. So given a set Y, the convex hull of Y is the set, so the notation will be conv Y, C-O-N-V Y, and it's defined to be the intersection overall x, well, contained in Rn, such that y is contained in x, and x is con convex of, of all, so, so it's, it's the intersection of all of the convex sets that contain y. So it's kind of a weird definition, but in some sense you should think of this as it's the, the smallest in a certain sense convex set that contains y. So for example, if you take, if y is just a set of points in the plane, for example, right, so, right, so, so if y is, is equal to this set, then the convex hull is just going to be, I mean, basically, in, in this case, it's, uh, way to think of the convex hull is taking like, if you take like an elastic band, right, and you put it around your set, right, and then you let go, 
it's going to give you all of these kind of straight line segments. And, and then you take all of the stuff inside. So this is going to be, so if y is those white points, then the convex hull is the red stuff. Right? Any questions about this? OK. Now here is a basic fact that about polytopes. Um, so, well, a polytope P is actually equal to the convex hull of its set of corners. And geometrically, you can sort of see why this might be true, right? So if you take, I mean, it, we, we sort of now know what, what polytopes sort of look like, at least in two dimensions. But you can imagine in three dimensions as well. You know, polytopes look like something like this. And if I take this polytope and I take its corners, right, and we kind of forget the polytope, and now you just take the convex hull of the corners, you're going to get the polytope back again. OK. So this is all we need about this com convex convexity stuff. Um, so now just a little bit of notation, which is kind of standard. But I think if I don't explain it, then probably somebody might be, might be confused about it. So, um, so given a finite set, because yeah, this might be notation you haven't seen before. So given a finite set, let's say S, um, so R to the power S, or you know, R, yeah, R to the S is the set of all real vectors, real valued vectors, indexed by the set X. So meaning that it's, so IE, it's vectors of the form Xi for I and S, where Xi is a real number for each I and S. So it's kind of the same thing as like, I mean, it's really the same thing as, as, as uh, I mean, it's isomorphic in a sense to, to R to the you know, size of S, right? As a vector space, they're the same. But it's useful sometimes to index your uh, vectors by elements of a set rather than indexing them from 1 up to n or something. In particular, when we're talking about these matchings and stuff, like it's usually what we're doing is we're indexing our vectors by the, uh, the edge set of a graph. Right? So So given a graph G and a subset of the edges, so and um, let's say M, okay, which is usually M is going to be a matching, but in this definition it could be any set. Uh, so the characteristic vector of M is the vector, so we're going to denote it by chi superscript M which is going to be just the vector chi e m, such that e is an edge of e, which is, going, which is in r to the e. So it's a, it's a real value vector um, indexed by the edges of the graph, where so each, of these, so each of these things is a real number, but actually I'm going to define it you know, specifically. So chi e of m, or chi, yeah, whichever way you want to say it, chi m e e m, whatever, it's uh, 1 if E is in M and 0 otherwise. <coughs> but it's, it's just like the, the vector which says kind of which edges are in M and which ones aren't. <coughs> so for example, if I let G be you know, this graph, just a triangle, let's say I call this edge E1, E2, and E3. Right? And if I let M be the set, or maybe I'll, let's make the graph more interesting. OK, I'll add another edge, so E4. So if I take, I don't know, <coughs> so if I take M to be the orange edges, then, so if you kind of, yeah, so then, well, so if you kind of think of, if you think of this as, I, if you think of this as a vector where the first coordinate corresponds to E1, then I have a 1 here because <coughs> E1 is in, the, in M, and here I have a 1, and here I have a 0 because E3 is not in M, 
and here I have a 1. So if you, if you sort of think of your, your coordinates as being indexed by edges in this order, so then, then this is your characteristic vector. Of course, you know, here we kind of don't have a natural ordering on the edges of a graph, so, so these, yeah, you can think of them coming in any order, it doesn't really matter. But, uh, yeah, so hopefully that example doesn't just confuse you more, but is it clear what uh, this characteristic vector is? Okay, so, so then the matching polytope, so putting all this together, so, uh, so the matching polytope of G is, so I'm going to, the notation I'll use is P sub M of G, and it's the convex hull of all of the characteristic vectors of matchings. So it's the convex hull of chi M, um, so all of the characteristic vectors chi M such that M is a matching in G. So if you kind of go through all of your matchings one by one, each of them gives you a point in R to the E, and now we take the convex hull of all of those points, and that gives you the matching polytope. <coughs> okay, so, so now let's, what I'm going to do now is we're going to use these things we proved on Wednesday to get an understanding of what the matching polytope looks like when G is bipartite. So. so if G is bipartite, then the matching polytope of G is precisely the, um, the set of well, let me see, the polytope uh, described by the following constraints. So first constraint is one we've seen a bunch of times. So um, the sum over all e e edges E containing B, XC is at most one for every vertex and you have non-negativity constraints so every, so the kind of variable for every edge is non-negative. So I should say perhaps the, the, it's the polytope in R to the E, right? So it's the set of all vectors in R to the E where the vectors satisfy these two constraints. So it's the set of all, yeah, X, E, E, and E, which satisfy these things. The proof of this is just going to apply what we proved last time about total, totally, total unit modularity. Right? So, So, okay, so first of all, just a bit of kind of notation. So let Q be the set of, or the polytope of vectors satisfying these constraints. So one and two. Right, so what we want to show is that the matching polytope of G is equal to Q. Because we want to show the matching polytope is actually the polytope described by these constraints. So I just let Q be that polytope, and we want to show that these two things are equal. So one direction turns out to be, so one direction meaning, so I want to show this one's contained in this one, and this one's contained in this one, right? One direction turns, to be, turns out to be easy, so So why is the perfect matching, or sorry, the, the matching polytope contained in Q? It's because the characteristic vector of any matching has to satisfy those constraints. So because so for every matching, so for every matching, the characteristic vector. <coughs> vector must satisfy the constraints, 
meaning, you know, at every vertex, there's at most one um, edge containing that vertex, so therefore, you have this inequality here, and obviously, everything is non-negative. And okay, so a slightly subtle thing here is that if every characteristic vector um, satisfies this, then also everything in the convex hull of those vectors also satisfies it. So, um, and so therefore, so so does every convex combination. of such vectors. What I mean here is basically if you take two different vectors satisfying one and two, and you take lambda times one of them plus one minus lambda times another, then you'll see that th these also satisfy the constraints. Okay, so now we, so we prove the opposite direction. For this direction, um, well, so now is where we need this total unimodularity condition. So we know that, so by, you know, two different theorems from, from last lecture, so, so G being bipartite implies that the incidence matrix is totally unimodular. Right, this is something we proved last time. And we also proved last time that if a matrix is totally unimodular, then um, if you take some constraints defined by that matrix where, yeah, where the kind of involving an integer vector, so let me just so kind of write it. So, okay, so, mm, well, so I'll, I'll write it and then I'll explain it. So the fact that the incidence matrix of G is totally unim unimodular implies that the corners of Q are integer vectors. Why? Because, because Q is, um, so if you go back to this definition of Q, so this is, so you can see, so if you write this in matrix form, right, the, if you write these constraints in matrix form, you'll see that um, the matrix you, in those constraints is exactly the incidence matrix of the graph, right? And on this side, all of these, so one is an integer, and so by this theorem from last time, if you have a constraint defined by a totally unimodular matrix times your variables is at most some integer vector, this, this constraint, all the, cons all the corners of the polytope must be integer vectors. Okay, so, so the corners of Q are integer vectors. And another thing that's not hard to see is that every integer vector in Q is actually the characteristic vector of a matching. Because if it wasn't, I mean, then, so if you take a, some integer vector which is not the characteristic ve vector of a matching, it's going to definitely violate one of these constraints. Right? Either some vertex will, will have too many, you know, you know, the xe for e containing v, it'll be too large, or you're going to have a negative number somewhere or something, you know, it ha so it has to be a matching. So therefore, so, so what we said before is that polytopes can only, always be defined as the um, convex hull of their corners, so therefore Q is the convex hull of, um, of its corners, and the corners are all integer vectors, so they're all characteristic vectors of matchings, so which are all characteristic vectors of matchings. So certainly, so Q is the, the convex cell of some set of um, characteristic vectors of matchings, so Q is contained in the convex hull of chi m such that m is matching, but that's just how we defined the matching polytope. I, I probably should have, so I, I did say that, but I probably should have, uh, so, okay, so, yeah, I sort of said it in words, but I didn't write it, so perhaps let me just kind of write this. This, 
So this sort of should be inserted kind of into the middle of this proof, right? So, well, to be honest, there's not like a, a load that I need to say about it, but actually, but so, I mean, so the constraint is the same as saying where A is the incidence matrix of G. I mean, if you just, I mean, this is, there's not really anything to prove here. It's just by definition, right? Because if you think of, so this, where this is the vector xc such that E, this is some sort of vector indexed by the edges and kind of the columns. So the way that you write A is you put the columns in the same order as you put the edges. Because the columns corresponding to ed correspond to edges, you kind of put these in the same kind of order. Yeah. So yeah, so that, that's the connection to the, oh yeah, so therefore Q is actually the set of all vectors such that, you know, AX is at most the all ones vector. So this has length the size of V, right? And, and the entries are non-negative. Right. And this is the sort of, and A is totally unimodular, so this is the sort of thing we were, yeah, so this thing has um, integer corners. But, yeah, so I tried to briefly mention that in the middle of the proof, but thanks for kind of making me do it more properly. So, yeah, so I mean, if you look at this constraint I, and you kind of think about what it's doing, it's not hard to see that it, it is exactly the same as this constraint. Yep. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so let's see a kind of, nice application to this, of this. So, okay, so some of you might remember Koenig's theorem from week three, which has come up several more times in the lectures. Um, so, so G is bipartite, then, so in symbols, so nu of G is equal to tau of G, where Nu of G is the max size of a matching. And this is the minimum size of a vertex cover, where a vertex cover is a set of vertices such that every edge contains at least one of them. So it's a set of vertices that hits all of the edges. And you, you might remember that this was actually pretty easy to prove combinatorially. So so in some sense, what I'm going to give you now is like, because we've built up all of this machinery, this is sort of a, in some sense, it's a more complicated proof of Koenig's theorem. But, but it's also quite nice to see that you can actually prove Koenig's theorem by applying um, linear programming duality. All right, so this, I think it's always nice to have kind of connections between topics which seem to be completely unrelated. Yeah, so like I said, we've already seen a proof of this theorem. But now we're going to see a, another proof. Um, so by the previous theorem, which I just erased, Remember, it said that the matching polytope is just the, uh, yeah, equivalent to the polytope given by these kind of natural constraints. Um, so by the previous theorem, so nu of G, the size of the biggest matching, is, is equal to the value of the linear program where I take, um, so I maximize So, so I want to find the biggest possible matching. I want to, so I have a variable for every edge. I want to, to make them as big as possible, subject to, so um, some overall edges containing a vertex, a given vertex D, X E is at most one for every vertex and Every edge has um, non-negative, non-negative variable.
right? So finding the biggest matching, because you know the, the matching polytope is, is precisely given by these vectors, uh, sorry, th these constraints. Um, nu of g is just equal to the value of this linear program, which is equal to the value of the dual, right? Because because of how LP duality works. So so by strong duality. So, so the value of this linear program okay so, so what's the dual so um, yeah so remember when you take a dual of a linear program right so, so here our constraint looks like this like I said before it's the constraint like ax is at most the all ones vector where a is the incidence matrix of the graph so the dual looks like this so it's minimizing Okay, so, so how these things work is that, so we have a constraint for every vertex. In the dual, the kind of, the constraints turn into variables. So we have a variable, so, so the following the variables. So we ha we'll have a variable for every vertex and we minimize, so, you t so okay, taking the dual, right, you take the, the coefficients you have for these constraints, and those become coefficients in your, um, what do you call it, objective function. So, so there's a kind of a one here corresponding to this one. So I, I, I understand that probably you've forgotten how to take duals, but, but if you were to check the definition, this, this, this is all going to be correct, I hope. Um, so subject to, so the constraint matrix, you're, what you do is you take the, so you take the matrix for th these constraints and you take its transpose, right? And if you think about it, when I take the transpose of the incidence matrix multiplied by some vector, you know, for corresponding to the vertices, what you get is that, um, okay, and this, this thing comes from the coefficients here. You have one on all of these. And so this is the dual. So here, yeah, so the so again, when you take the dual, the constraint matrix is the transpose of your other matrix. And, and you, if you think about it, when you multiply the transpose to, 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 to this vector, you're going to get, you know, basically precisely every edge has you know, for every edge u v, you have y of u plus y of v is at least one. Um, and yeah, so well, so this. I mean, if you think about what this what this linear program is doing, you can see it's it's at least very similar to to finding a, a minimum um, vertex cover, right? So you kind of give every. So if you think of an integer solution to this, it's exactly going to be a vertex cover, essentially, right? So if, if you think of all of these y v's as being either zero or one, you want to. So the constraint says that every edge has to have some vertex in the cover, and your objective is to minimize the total number of vertices in the vertex cover, right? So, okay, but so now the key thing for why this works is that uh, so. So the thing is that if I take the incidence matrix of the graph and I take its transpose, this is also totally unimodular. And this is just because, so what is, to, this by definition. So A is totally unimodular, which means that every square submatrix has determinant 0, 1, or minus 1. And that's going to be true for the transpose as well because the determinant of the transpose equals the determinant of the matrix. So, uh, so basically, so the dual is optimized by an integer vector. And basically, if I let, and so if, also if y is feasible for the dual, so let's say that, yeah, 
and is an integer vector, um, then if I take all the vertices such that yv is at least 1, this is a vertex cover. Right? Because every edge would have to contain at least one such vertex by the constraint. And so therefore, the dual computes tau of g. And by strong duality, we know that the value of the linear program is equal to the value of the dual. So nu of g is equal to tau of g. So there's a more complicated proof of, of Koenig's theorem than, than what we had before. But, but it all just follows from strong duality. Um, yeah, so I apologize. I understand that you, you probably have forgotten how duals of linear programs work. But if you, did, if you do look in your notes and kind of compare what I'm doing here to what taking the dual is, hopefully you, you can see that, um, that you know, this really is the dual of that. And then, and then everything else is just kind of by this total unimodularity. OK, I'm just going to end by um, mentioning a theorem that we're not going to prove. But I think it's, it's a nice theorem because it connects all of these things that we've been doing to, uh, to the Tut-Burge formula and Tut's one-factor theorem. So, um, right, so we know that so if you take a bipartite graph, then the uh, matching polytope is just given by these constraints up there. Um, but what about a non-bipartite graph? Right? So, so when, when the graph is not bipartite, you don't have total unimodularity. You don't have any of these things. So you can't, so certainly you can't just write down these constraints. You're going to need something else. And so this theorem is called Edmonds matching polytope theorem. So like I said, we're not going to prove this, so it's not crucial that you know this. But I think it's, it connects things quite nicely. So it says that for any graph, so not necessarily bipartite, the matching polytope is precisely the polytope given by the following constraints. So we have the same one as before, you know, first of all. So, um, so again, you know, if, if I look at any vertex, you can't, uh, yeah, you need that all of the edges have containing that vertex of value at most one. Um, the last constraint is also going to be the same, that you have non-negativity. But then we have another constraint about this oddness, right? So, so remember when you have a this this thing that was when we when we were talking about the tut burge formula and the one factor Tut's one factor theorem, there was this thing that you know a key thing was that if you have an odd number of things, you just can't possibly match them all up, right? So this this last constraint says that so okay so for every odd set. Such that so every set such that the size is odd, you have that if I sum over all of the edges which are contained in u, so these are edges completely contained inside of u, and I take xe, that has to be at most the size of u minus 1 over 2. Okay. And that's just sort of saying in an odd set, if you just try to pair things up, you know, how many pairings can there be? And it's at most like half the vertices kind of minus, yeah, half of the number of vertices minus 1, just by parity. So I think that's kind of nice, right? So, so when it's non-bipartite, these two constraints aren't quite enough. But if you add this constraint, then you can completely describe the mass matching polytope. OK, so any, any questions before we stop? OK, and see you tomorrow.